Welcome to Hale Varsity Radio, the voice of Husker Nation. Insight, opinion, expertise, with the biggest and best names talking Nebraska across the state. Join the show on Twitter at Hale Varsity and at Schmitz underscore radio. Call in at 402-466-ESPN or 1-800-825-5865. Here's Chris Schmitz. Welcome to it, Road Show Wednesday on Hale Bar City Radio. We are down here at Longwell State Tournament Central as it is basketball fever, and we have gotten so much representation from the great state of Nebraska. Milford and Concordia going on across the street at PBA. Folks are enjoying, enjoying a, a frosty one down here, and we are set for basketball. We'll talk plenty of football. And uh, it's all good here on a Wednesday with Hale Bar City Radio. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal, numbers to get in 466 3776, 466 3776, 800, 825 5865. Those are the numbers. You can email Chris at HaleVarsity.com. And as always, find and follow us on Twitter at Schmidt underscore radio. Chris Schmidt at Herbal Essence for Elijah. Herbal and uh, just a great day of basketball yesterday. Uh, buzzer beater that was really rough and tough for Pius, but a great season for the Bolts. Lincoln East uh, gave Bellevue West the defending champs, champs everything they wanted in the evening session. You have Waverly and uh, Norris advancing yesterday, but uh, Waverly getting it done today. The fighting Garth Glissmans of Parkview Christian. Uh, one earlier. They're back in action tomorrow. And uh, you had a happy bunch of, of Auburn fans as they're uh, just a really high level basketball team. Coach Weeks is uh, running that show the right way. A lot of red Auburn fans in uh, Longwells. But there's uh, Beatrice representation. There's Auburn folks still having a frosty one. Uh, I think all of Milford moved from Longwells across the street into PBA. And uh, we even got some Concordia fans that were here and were uh, watching the ball game and uh, getting set. Elijah, what do you know? How's your Wednesday going? What's shaking? Uh, it, it's going well. The, the, the one thing I have to complain about while, while I'm here is that I got home last night from playing basketball. And my roommate, who's a plumber, says, hey, we don't have any hot water. The, the hot water heater's broken. And I said, what, what's wrong with it? And he said, I don't know. So he must not be that good a plumber. I, I have been going without hot water now for about 24 hours um i'm making it through but the, the cold showers are they're, they're getting to me i'm starting to go a little crazy <laughs> so you said to your roommate plumber get off your and fix the freaking hot water right i mean that's that's your that's your role that's yeah. your job i'm sure you are less than patient with him um well he went to bed early last night after toiling with it for like an hour um and then uh, he should be getting home from work any time now. So I'm hoping whenever I get home from the show tonight that we're going to have hot water. But if not, I, I may snap. Well, putting him on blast never hurt nobody. <laughs> uh, we're uh, excited to have some thoughts from uh, legendary Hall of Fame football coach Tom Osborne. Coach uh, had a, a just a really cool ceremony earlier uh, today at uh, Best of Big Red. And... Uh, this uh, award that was given to, uh, to Coach Osborne uh, it was really special to him. And you can imagine like T.O.'s house, right? You've got your film room, you've got your living room, and then you, you've got your football room. And uh, <laughs> uh, the, the award that was given uh, is something that, of all the awards coach got, uh, this thing's really special. And just to give you a quick little preview, and it was really kind of a, a minute media setup uh, where you had 10 11 there, and, and we were there from Hale Varsity and Heard at Media. And uh, you had uh, the alumni cap uh, presentation, which is it's really a cool setup by, by Tony and Josh Davis and Amon Green. And it's this, this giant plaque detailing and highlighting all of the credentials and then it went further with a, a, a zoom setup where coach osborne got uh, thank yous and praise and love from uh, a lot of his former players so it was kind of a surprise for to today with that and we had a, about seven or eight minutes with coach osborne 
and uh, we will get into that conversation with him in a little bit. But uh, Elijah, it's pretty cool because we, we cover quite a few things with Coach Osborne just to, to preview it here. That's going to come up at 525 tonight. We'll check in with T.O. Uh, not only on how, how teammates is going, but also, you know, Oklahoma, Nebraska looms next fall. Spring football's around the corner. And uh, the topic of quarterback play and transfer portal. So all those things uh, we get uh, a chance to sit down with and talk to Coach Osborne about. That's coming up here in about an hour and 20 minutes. Jeff Smith, uh, Hall of Fame basketball coach, great coach for Southeast, former assistant for Danny Nee. Coach Smith, uh, my radio partner for Boys State, uh, going to join us at the 5 o'clock hour. Get ready for Nebraska, Penn State, but overall kind of a take on on, you know, the Big Ten heading into the tournament. Mike Babcock will talk some Husker baseball and get his take on some Kansas football as that thing is an absolute tire fire. And then some golf. If you're off the tee box with the wind at your back, you're having a good day today. So that's the lineup, 466-377-6800-825-5865. So, uh, Elijah, real quick, we'll get into some hoops before we get into, you know, the college football news of the day, and that's, uh, Les Miles out, and then now athletic director uh, Jeff Long has resigned. You know, it, it's pretty simple for me with Nebraska basketball tonight. Uh, they got to stay uh, as good as they've been from three-point land. Uh, they got to be better rebounding against Penn State, even though they won one of the meetings. There's been a pretty big disparity in scoring uh, game two versus game one. Nebraska really took a vacation defensively in that second game. And, and they got to kind of get back to this both end grind mentality. And they've been good and better offensively, but they've not been winning with defense. Uh, even though they've won two out of their last four, they've dropped two. I think it's huge. As much momentum as you feel about Nebraska basketball, at least, all right, they're getting better. They could be better next year. There's a lot returning next year. You want to at least go in to the off season, right, with at least a win. Penn State, I don't think, will destroy you. They can sure beat you. Maybe they're 7 to 10 points better uh, or less. But if I'm Nebraska right now, I mean, you, you should have beat Northwestern. You should have beat Illinois. And Fred is not wrong that you're Five and five in your last ten as you come down the stretch. A lot of teams would take that. Most of us would take that in this year's Big Ten. And, and Nebraska's really not that far off from it. Uh, but you can't go out uh, looking disinterested. You can't go out uh, not focused. And that's kind of been my problem. Nebraska had a two-game win streak. Iowa's great. Don't get me wrong. But Nebraska was just really not focused against Iowa. Uh, don't know what that was about. And then Nebraska uh, against Northwestern got down by 16 and then put a nice run together, had a chance to win and close it out. Didn't do it, and it kind of came down to a little thing. So I'm looking for Nebraska to be, uh, you know, I won't say as, as locked in as they were at Rutgers, but for sure, uh, you know, as locked in uh, defensively as they were the first time they beat Penn State. And this is the third meeting, Elijah, so it should be, pretty familiar for Nebraska. They know what they got to do, and they're shooting better. Let's see if the defense shows up today in Indianapolis. Yeah, and I saw from uh, from Darren Ravel on Twitter that Nebraska currently has the steepest odds of any team in the Power Five. Yeah, lay those Vegas. out. Those are nuts. Yeah, uh, let me pull up the tweet in front is, is of me. Is it like 3,000 to 1? Uh, I think it's like 5,000. Uh, me... Okay, I'm sorry. I was 2G shy. But yeah, it's like 5,000 to 1 uh, of all Power Five teams to run the tournament and run the table in postseason. Nebraska's the longest of long shots. Oh, I'm trying to pull up the tweet in front of me, but but essentially, Nebraska isn't a threat here to, to win the Big Ten tournament. Uh, I, I'm not going to sugarcoat things and act like they are. Um, so I, I think the key for Nebraska just in the Big Ten tournament uh, tonight especially is to just get some momentum going into the postseason because these last couple games here, is a big just momentum and, and mood booster as you're heading into your offseason. Are your offseason practices going to be with hope for getting better next year? Are you going to say, 
man, the end of last year sucked. We had some, we had some positive things going for us, and then we let them all go by the wayside, uh, and we were just terrible in the Big Ten tournament. And that sets the mood for offseason practices, especially with that, that big loss to Iowa. Coach Hoiberg said, uh, we want to go down swinging. Uh, and that's how they want to finish the season. I, I think they did that against Northwestern, uh, despite not winning. It, it was going down swinging. I think against Penn State, Keith Knight, is just swing. Show them that you're, you're there. Uh, you've had some extra rest time than you've had at the end of the season. Uh, we were saying in those games, the key was kind of to, to get yourself a lead early. Uh, I still think that's the key here, getting eight, ten-point lead in the first half and try to hold on to it. Um, but it's all about just playing well uh, and playing up to your ability because if you can do that, that'll get you some good momentum going into your offseason and heading into to next season, even though it seems so far away. You know, Nebraska's lost the last few games by uh, a few points. They've been close, and not in Iowa, obviously, but, I mean, Nebraska had like 11 first-half turnovers against Iowa. Nebraska had uh, nine first-half turnovers against Northwestern. You do the math on those points off turnovers or just screwing yourself out of possessions. That to me is is what I gotta see better from Nebraska. They gotta take care of the basketball and I don't know that they will, but they gotta be more focused. It was just careless giveaways. And is that gonna change all of a sudden with postseason basketball? I don't know. Again, it comes down to being locked in and, and mentally focused. All right, college football. And uh, you know, there, there's been a lot of coaching changes and a lot of programs over the last 20 years, Nebraska's had several coaching changes. Tennessee's had several coaching changes. Uh, Kansas has had several coaching changes. And uh, the AD, uh, Jeff Long, is out. He was the original college football playoff chairman. Uh, he had been in Arkansas for a while. And at, at the time, he was able to hire Bobby Petrino away from the Falcons. He got Arkansas to a Sugar Bowl. And then uh, Bobby jumped on a Harley with a blonde. That didn't end well. Uh, he hired Brett Bielema, who was not awful at Arkansas, but rarely won uh, in the SEC. And uh, eventually that moved on, and Long was out at Arkansas. Uh, Mike Anderson uh, at Arkansas for basketball. So he had, a, he had a, a pretty good trial run at an SEC school. And, and then he, he ended up getting the Kansas job, right? And what's happened at Kansas, uh, Kansas having to dismiss Les Miles. Uh, this goes all the way back to uh, Les being uh, a crusty old guy, allegedly, at LSU. And then you had the mother of all <laughs> mess-ups at the press conference by Long as far as the background check and winning on the field comments. Uh, similar to that where, you know, nothing was wrong on the field with Les Miles. Well, that really ticked off a lot of Kansas alum and uh, the university uh, moving on from athletic director Jeff Long. So Kansas in the next two weeks needs to hire an athletic director. Uh, Their president will do that, and then they will absolutely hire uh, a head football coach. And can they get the, the, the right athletic director to go get a stable head coach and in kansas listen glenn mason was phenomenal glenn mason was was winning nine or ten games now glenn mason's uh been away from kansas for a while because he left ku for minnesota uh but when they went and got mangino mangino was I don't want to say dirty enough, but good enough to, to win. Go 7-5, and 8-5, and five, go 12-1, and one, go to an Orange Bowl. And he may have to bend the rules a little bit to get kids, but it wasn't, all right, we're going to strap you into the electric chair, uh, bend the rules. Okay, it wasn't SMU bad. So they had a thing going, but Mangino was just intolerable down there with people. And the minute they could get rid of him, they did. They hired Turner Gill, loved Turner. But Turner just didn't do uh, what he needed to do at Kansas. And that was too big of a 180, to be honest with you, with Mangino to Turner. They go get Beatty, and then they go make the splash higher. Tell me why, right? And, and it, it comes down to needing a shift from a big name to the right fit. And ADs always want to swing for the fence, stake their reputation on getting this monster name. And for too many years... Kansas has gone with the name game, right? What'd they do? They hired Les Miles. Les Miles was 
Did he have some ball left in him? Maybe you thought so. Would he reinvent? No, didn't. Uh, didn't do that at all. Uh, prior to that, they went and hired Fat Charlie, right? I mean, uh, Charlie Weiss was a guy who beat out Gary Barnett for the job down at Kansas. They should have hired Gary. Gary'd still be coaching and Gary'd be winning. So Kansas has made a lot of mistakes, not just under Jeff Long's watch, but Jeff Long's history has been uh, really more miss than hit. It's not that Petrino was a bad football hire at Arkansas. It's that Petrino had a girlfriend and wrecked his Harley. That type of off the field behavior. Uh, the background, what what was Les's baggage coming from LSU other than his pro-style offense with a garbage quarterback wasn't beating Saban? Well, there's more to that iceberg with, uh, with Les Miles. And Kansas just hired a guy they thought could win versus, all right, what's the morals attached to this guy? So if I'm uh, Kansas, I got to go get me an AD that can talk about Army's Jeff Monken. Mm-hmm. And, and – Elijah, if you're Kansas, and Coach Osborne has said this, you got to be special offensively where it's not something you see every day. And uh, you've seen it on social media. I think we're all in on the option down in Lawrence, aren't we? Yeah, they don't have the money or the facilities to to go get the top-name recruits every year. And the triple option thrives in a, a system where you can't get the top-name recruits. You can make it work with anyone. We'll spend some more time with Mike Babcock on this. Hale Varsity, we're live at Longwell's State Tournament Wednesday. We're presented by the Nebraska Lottery. And now. And now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. Back here at Longwell's State Tournament Wednesday, Hale Varsity Radio Road Show, and we've got representation from uh, our friends out at North Platte. Uh, we've got Beatrice uh, in the corner over there. Auburn fans are still whooping it up. I was hoping to see a, a Chris or a Chad Kelsey Jr. Uh, jersey uh, on here. And uh, right now, you've got uh, Milford, Milford and Concordia rocking here about halfway home in the second quarter. Uh, just across the street at PBA. We welcome in Mike Babcock, HaleVarsity.com and Magazine, and historian, author, and Hall of Famer. Babbers, you ready to cut some nets down? How are you? Hey, I'm doing okay. That's uh, you know I grew up in York, but Beatrice, that's where I was born. So, so you're wearing Beatrice, some orange. Right? What's that? So you're wearing some orange. <laughs> no, I don't. Uh, I don't have much orange actually. <laughs> that's all I right. Should, I probably yeah. should have some, shouldn't I? Well, as many times you've been to the Orange Bowl, I would think there'd be some sort of little orange. Well, oh, yeah, yeah, no, no, I do, I do. Hanging in a closet, I do have a, you know, back in the day, the Orange Bowl gave out stuff to, like, media. When you came down there, I have a nice windbreaker from uh, from the Orange Bowl that's orange. Is there a giant FedEx insignia on the side? Um, no, this was, uh, this is just the Orange Bowl logo. Um, oh, cool. Before, I think they had a sponsor. This was way back. Um. Yeah, yeah. Now it would it would be all sponsorship type stuff. No, this is just a uh, says Orange Bowl on it or something. Babbers, uh, we're going to start with some college football and, and three Nebraska names, and give me your thought a on the Kansas job. Is it is it fixable down in Lawrence? But I'm thinking Jay Norvell. I'm thinking Craig Bull. I'm thinking Lance Leopold. Whoever the new boss in the athletic director chair at, KD, at KU uh, would be foolish not to, to lob phone calls to those guys. Uh, but but how uh, viable is that phone call going to be with where all three guys are at? Where's Kansas go? Well, you know, that's a good question, Chris. Uh, I was just looking uh, through the coaches just out of curiosity. And, and uh uh, man, Gino, over the course of his career, he won two more games than he lost at Kansas. Okay, mm-hmm. so um, he's the only coach for his career at Kansas that has a winning record until you go back to the early 50s. Wow. I mean, that's... That even counts know, Glenn Mason, right? Uh, you know, Mason didn't even have a winning record overall for his career. Uh, his... Uh, I've got it right here. I marked it down. 466 his overall career was. 
No, you got to go back to some Jules B. Sykes, a person I don't even recognize. <laughs> Coach from 48 to 53. Good old uh, Jules. Had a winning percentage. And, uh, you know, and George Sauer coached before that uh, just a couple of seasons, but that's a former Husker. Um, but, uh, yeah, Kent, you know, that, that's, the th- that's the difficult thing because – Basketball is so high profile at Kansas, and it's got problems of its own mm-hmm. uh, with the NCAA. But uh, uh, Kansas basketball is so high profile. I think it really makes it difficult um, to get things going with a football program when you've had that kind of lack, in general, lack of success over the years. And uh, well, I just really think it's going to be difficult. Uh, to get somebody in there to get things turned around. You're really going to have to be patient. You're going to have to get the right guy. And the three people that you mentioned, you know, that's um, Jay Norvell would be probably somebody that could do it um, if people were patient. But, um, gosh, that, that's, a, that's a tough, tough go. You know, that's the thing that you just have to find the right guy and have some patience, and, and the example I would use is just uh, not very far away from there, uh, Kansas State, and what uh, Bill Snyder was able to do over the course of his career. And, uh, you know, I think coming in, he had a real good sense of, hey, um, we're going to have to get junior college players, and he did, a, he did a really good job of getting the right junior college players that produced for him. And uh, he got things turned around. And, you know, people say, well, they, you know, they played. Uh, I just saw somebody uh, today, we had a question on the uh, Hale Varsity mailbag um, related to uh, Bill Snyder and the scheduling weak non-conference opponents. But you have to start somewhere. You have to build the winning mentality first, and then you go from there. And, and Bill Snyder did a great job of that. Um, taking a Kansas State program that had had, had no success uh, for years and years and years and years and years and uh, turned things around and made them competitive. And uh, that's what you're going to probably have to do at Kansas, particularly with a, with a basketball uh, school like that is. And, uh, you know, you got to be concerned about basketball right now with the NCAA stuff. And you know, it's been kind of up and down for the basketball team, but, you know, I think they're – maybe peaking at the right time. Mike, one of the problems that I see with Kansas football is they sh- struggle to recruit good enough talent to be able to find success in, in a conference like the Big 12. And I thought whenever uh, Les Miles was hired that maybe a name like Les Miles would be big enough that some recruits would hear the name Les Miles and go, okay, I know Les Miles. I'll go play for Les Miles. But not really the case. He's struggled to find success now being let go. Um, but one of the systems – of offense that I think doesn't need top end talents, the triple option. We talked about it a little bit in the first segment that you can have undersized guys, guys that aren't the most talented and, and athletic in the world to run the triple option. Uh, it's what they do at the service academies all the time to field some good teams. And, and Jeff Monken out, out of Army, he's fielded some great teams the past couple of years uh, with some undersized players, not the best talent. So, so could you see a guy like Jeff Monken bringing the triple option to Kansas and, and maybe the triple option could find success in uh, Power Five football yet again? Well, yeah, you know, I, I've, I, I guess I'm old and I've always thought that, Elijah. But, um, um, yeah, you, you have to uh, – you can get those quarterbacks that don't aspire necessarily to play in the NFL, you know, to run a triple option, athletic guys like that. Um, and if you get the right guy that to, can run it, um, I think you could do it. Um, and it's different enough. You know, as Nebraska found out, playing in the old Big Eight, you know, Tom Osborne figured that out. It's like, hey, you know, part of the problem in, in playing Oklahoma every year and not having success against Oklahoma was Oklahoma did things so much different, differently than the other teams in the conference. Um, and, and so you had to spend time on it. You know, it got to the point where, where uh, Nebraska was spending time on it uh, during each week of practice during the season when they weren't even preparing to play Oklahoma until the end of the year. Um, and then Nebraska went to the, went to an option offense and it was a little bit different. So you're practicing against that kind of thing. So the difference there would be a positive. The one thing that you would, would be difficult still is you got to have a defense that can stop stuff. And uh, um, that's part of the problem too. So it can't just be something unique in offense. you got to figure out how to, how to play defensively. There are just a lot of things 
that have to happen for Kansas. I think Kansas football to get things turned around. Mike Babcox with us uh, from HaleVarsity.com and Magazine at MD Babs on Twitter. Babber's going to switch gears to some Nebraska baseball and 3-1 and one to get the weekend kicked off last week against Purdue was awesome. Um, some self-inflicted stuff uh, that first game, but Nebraska really shook it off. Uh, they did leave too many runners on base. They struck out a lot, but we're whining. At least I'm whining. <laughs> I'll take the, the long ball, the home runs. The pitching was stellar for the most part. Um, you had uh, the the ability to, to get some, some key hits. And you had freshmen between Matthews and Max Anderson really do damage, Babbers. What, what did uh, this past weekend mean for you as you look at this baseball team? And I know they've got Iowa and I know they got Ohio State at U.S. Bank this weekend, but really it went extremely well, and I love the bounce back after that first difficult ball game. Yeah, Smitty, as you point out, that's the, you know, three and one and the, and the good – the, the other good part of that is that you lose the first game and then there's some questions, you know. You lose that first game and you lose it in a frustrating way. Um, how is a team going to respond? And it did. You know, it responded by winning three games. And and that, you know, that's, that mindset is really important. You know, that, that the team played the way Will Bolt played when he was a Husker, you know, just hard edge and never give up and and, uh, keep on scrapping kind of a thing. And um, that was the most impressive thing to me. You know, yeah, they they struck out 46 times in four games, two of which were seven inning games. Um, You don't want to strike out that much. That's, That's not a good situation. But again, we're just looking at things to, you know, you can always, there can always be improvement. And uh, it, but you know I thought uh, Swellenbach coming in and pitching an inning in the uh, fourth game, um, you know he hadn't pitched in Nebraska yet. They feel good about him. They're going to get more opportunity for him. He could end up being a closer for him. Uh, Hallmark, you know now he played second base last year. He's playing center field. He came in and pitched an inning. Uh, you're, you're getting guys, the uh, veteran guys, that are mixing in with these with the young guys, the type of guys that you mentioned, um, I really think that they have the makings of a a, a pretty successful season. But we'll find out more because Ohio State in particular uh, was off to a good start against Illinois, and I think Ohio State is is pretty good. But, you know, as we've talked before, Smitty, that's one of the concerns is when you're only playing Big Ten teams and the National Collegiate Baseball Writers Association poll came out this week and no Big Ten teams are in the top 30. Um, you've got to have an impressive record against those teams in order to get your get, be in a position to, to get to the uh, NCAA. Mike, got about a minute left here, and I, I personally loved the energy from the Husker baseball team this weekend. I, I thought the pitching was nice, uh, but I was really impressed by freshman, freshman Max Anderson. He had himself a weekend, um, but I was looking, and I saw I thought he was going to be in the running for Big Ten Player of the Week. Doesn't win Big Ten Player of the Week and, and doesn't even win Big Ten Freshman of the Week. Seems like a, a real snub to me, but what, what do you think of uh, the weekend that Max Anderson had? Well, yeah, it was, it was pretty remarkable um, what he did. You know, he pitched the home run. Uh, first time up, and, and uh, uh, he, he, you know, the fourth game, he walks the first three times he bats, you know, which shows some patience there. You know, he he understands things. I, you know, I was just impressed with, uh, I guess it's appropriate that he's wearing number four, right, uh, Alex Gordon. But, uh, um, yeah, I, I was really impressed with him and the maturity that he showed. Uh, for a freshman, I thought that was good. But, they, you know, they had, like you said, you guys said there are other freshmen that uh, contribute as well. So um, it's a good mix of young young newcomer guys, uh, some JUCO guys, and, and uh, returning, returning guys. Babbers, we want you to have a good rest of the week and enjoy some basketball and get caught up with some baseball as well. Thanks for jumping on with us today, bud. Hey, thanks for having me. Keep up the good work. Be safe. All right, there he is, Mike Babcock. We'll check in with Mike Schuart. Uh, Tournament Central right here, Boys State down here at Longwells on a Wednesday with Hale Varsity. And we're back. Fellas, I think we could 
listen to the radio listen. On Hale Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Yes! That's awesome! Back here at Longwell's State Tournament Central, Hale Varsity Radio Roadshow Wednesday. Halftime between Concordia and Milford going on. And uh, we'll have Jeff Smith coming up a little bit after 5. Coach Tom Osborne, our sit-down with him uh, a little bit after 5.20. Uh, he is on the tee box, and we welcome in Mike Schuart, Wilderness Ridge Golf. Should we? We've got all sorts of Nebraska fans down here, all sorts of uh, different uh, setups as well. You got uh, St. Pat's here, North, North Platts uh, in full throat. Uh, you've got uh, the crew from Beatrice across the way. There's so much Auburn love down here. It's nice. And uh, have you been working on your free throws along with your putting today? Yeah, man. That's got to be fun being down there with all those people, finally. It's good. It is. All those people a is long the time. key term. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, it's been way too long. Well, with people down here, that means there's got to be people on the deck at Wilderness. Oh, yeah. There's a few out there. It's a little, little breezy today, but, man, it's been beautiful the last few days. It's been a lot of golf being played, people enjoying and enjoying the deck. That's outstanding. Shuey, we saw the uh, tweet out by uh, Wilderness Ridge. Oh, I think it was this weekend, actually, and, and they had kind of a, a, a rendering, kind of uh-huh. a video simulation of what wilderness is, is going to look like once all the, uh, the construction is done. And, brother, this aquatic center that you're going to have, along with championship golf, is incredible. You've got to have... You've had to have had a, a lot of feedback and response to that. That's that's outstanding. In, in your dreams, did you think it'd be a reality? Never. Never, never, never. You know, and it's like, oh, we thought something like that, but never did I think that was really going to happen. And now that it is happening and what they are putting in, it, it's second to none. I mean, it's pretty impressive. So I knew when I'd seen that, aquatic center before they they put it out there it was like it blew me away the first time i saw it so i knew when it finally went kind of out there to the public that people would be a little bit awed by it and uh, we've had a lot of great response so it's been fabulous mike schuart's with us wilderness ridge golf hail varsity radio road show wednesday here state tournament central at uh, long wells concordia on top of milford 24 to uh to 23 Shuey, uh, let's uh, talk some golf here. As I know Rory was was talking to some of the media, and uh, he's thinking Tiger could get out of the the, the hospital here relatively soon. Uh, what's your What's your take on that here? What What have you been following? What have you kind of been uh, keeping your eye on here with with Tiger? And it also is you know as we gear up towards uh, towards Augusta here, not too long away. Yeah, I know. That's right around the corner. That's always a pretty special time for golf when, it, when the Masters hits. So, yeah, it was just kind of encouraging. I guess all the surgeries and everything went well um, with what they could do with Tiger. And, uh, you know, it sounds like he's got a long recovery ahead of him. But, you know, not really talking anything about golf, just more about just his health in general, you know, and with him being able to walk. You know, that was a big concern for a while. And it looks like, you know, things went well. So time will only tell. Shuey, what did you think of Bryson last weekend? And I was uh, able to catch between tournament games uh, a little bit of the Twitter buzz with, well, I'll be flat out honest. It it looked like the mother of all shank shots where Bryson ended up cutting it and out driving the the world. Uh, but But it went so far right off of his driver and it was perfectly placed. I was, oh, why can't I do that? Can you help me do that, Chewy? <laughs> um, you might be able to do it one time, and then you would probably be <laughs> in a hospital bed, <laughs> you and me both. I mean, it's it's pretty incredible what he's been able to, to do, you know. I'm not sure if I like it or not. I mean, he's, he's just doing things that are crazy. You know, but that being said, it's like, you know, he is, when John Daly came on the scene years ago, it had the same kind of feel and, and awe of how far this guy could hit it. Now Bryson has 
taking it to a whole other level, which is absolutely amazing. So it's like, I, I'm not sure if I like it or not. I mean, I, I like the showmanship of it and what he can do, but as far as, and he can play, obviously he wins, but it's mm-hmm. like, I'm, I'm old school, man. I'm more of a guy that kind of position the golf ball around the golf course to play. Now he's just smashes as far as he can, get as close to the green and chip it on and make a birdie. So, a little different game. What's your take on, on the PGA Tour yesterday saying, you know what, in the interest of safety for volunteers <laughs> and other personnel, they're going to be instituting that internal out-of-bounds area on 18 at TPC Sawgrass. Uh, that's obviously at uh, Puente Verde Beach in Florida. Uh, what's that mean to you? Uh, your take on if it'll have an, an effect on DeChambeau? Oh, I mean, it, it, it won't have an effect because he won't care, man. He's going to hit it over there and see if he can hit it back out of play, back into play. You know, I've never, I've never been a big fan of an internal out of bounds on a golf course, but with what guys are doing and where they're hitting it and lines that they're chasing. I mean, some of these golf courses kind of have to do some of those things to protect the golf course a little bit, you know? So it's like, that's, that, that's the distance issue that's coming, man. It's like these golf courses are becoming obsolete in how guys have to play and can play certain holes. And it's like, man, you can only do so much, you know, to keep them in check somewhat. Mike Shuart's with us, uh, Wilderness Ridge Golf, Shuey out at Wilderness. Check out the Wilderness Ridge Twitter handle for uh, their renderings of their aquatic center, their uh, their championship golf course set up, the talent course, beautiful. Now, Shuey, we got a couple of minutes left. Uh, talk to folks about lessons, about fitting, about CNU, about membership. And, of course, I think what's so awesome, and so many families have, have rushed to join because of what you and your crew do for youth golf, brother. And that's so impressive. Such a nice setup uh, with uh, the young ones that are out there playing playing golf and learning the right way. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, you know, player development and youth player development, we have a big passion for that. We love it. You know, we love to, to really be involved in that. So we just kind of sent out our first uh, youth player development uh, time. So we've had great feedback with that. You know, we have uh, a Mizuno fitting coming up in, in a couple weeks. We have a PXG fitting actually tomorrow that we have like 12 people signed up for already. So, I mean, it's it's golf time, you know. People have been pinned up too long in February. So uh, they're starting to take advantage of a lot of things that are out there. So it's exciting to see. Mike Shuey, our Wilderness Ridge Golf. Go see Shuey out at Wilderness. Shuey, uh, I think uh, Elijah will talk to you next week. I'll be uh, putting for bogey. Oh, I like it. Putting for birdie, you mean, right? That's right, brother. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk soon. All right. Thank you. And we're back. Fellas, I think we could listen to the radio. On Hale Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Yes! That's awesome! Back here at Longwell, Tournament Central, Wednesday State Hoops. You've got top seed Milford, unbeaten Milford uh, on the ropes right now. They are down 35-23 to Concordia, Omaha. And uh, we've got a bunch of folks in here waiting for the uh, the 6 o'clock tip. Folks from Pierce, Nebraska, the Fighting Matt Harriots uh, are down here, which is cool. Uh, Jeff Smith, uh, longtime Hall of Fame coach at Southeast and assistant to Coach Danny Nee with us next hour. Our conversation with Tom Osborne, Coach T.O., uh, and his uh, alumni cap presentation earlier today. It was pretty special to see uh, Tony Veland and Josh Davis uh, present that to him. Steve Glenn was down, a great offensive lineman in the late 70s, also was there. And then a number of Husker greats uh, on Zoom to s- send their love to Coach and Really pretty cool, uh, and we had a chance to talk some college ball with uh, Coach Osborne, so you'll hear some of that coming up here in about uh, 30 minutes. Reminder about buckling up, and uh, we'll tell you to do that next hour. But if you're moving, West Blue Realty is the name you need to know for Lincoln and the surrounding community, and you know what real estate's like right now. Uh, there are 
uh, a few homes and there is that specific one you're thinking of or maybe you're thinking of moving on because the market is what it is give tom luby a call with west blue realty at 402 540-3768. Kelly Hofschneider, 402-202-2312. Tom and Kelly can help and, and make that work for you. You mentioned Hale Varsity can get up to $1,000 on the closing of your next home purchase. Log on today, westbluerealty.com, 1120K Street, Suite 200 is um, where you find them. They also can help with agricultural land. And uh, they've sold a, a large swath of, uh, of ag land here in uh, the great state of Nebraska. A couple of final thoughts here on, on KU football, Elijah. I like your take on the option idea. I, I think uh, Monken is the way you go. And I think your point about uh, kind of doing uh, it with a specific offense that you don't see every day is, is a winner. You can win at Kansas You can recruit at Kansas, and you can kind of go the Bill Snyder 2.0 route like Mangino did when I think of Briscoe and Reesing and Sharp and and some of those kids that were on the the Kansas team that that went 12-1. And and you know how tough those games were against Mangino for Nebraska. Uh, I'm not talking the 76-point outburst. I'm talking years prior where Nebraska won, but they were – they were dogfights, and even year one of the Polini era, where uh, Roy Halu had to put the Superman cape on uh, in 08 and 09, honestly. I mean, so you can get some ballers down there, but you got to be able to evaluate them. And whatever you think of Mangino uh, and his temper, that's that's what he could do down there. So you got to kind of kind of find the right guy. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. It just it's kind of the same thing we talked about with Nebraska. Is you can't get those recruits until you win, but it's it's hard to to win without the recruits. So you, you got to be able to to punch above your level a little bit. And I think that's why I suggest the triple option. I think that's one way to do it. But another coach could do it as well. Absolutely. We'll wind down. Jeff Smith's coming up. Hale Varsity continues. We're down here at Longwell's Tournament Central. Uh, state basketball going on. Coach Osborne on next hour as well with Hale Varsity. Welcome to Hale Varsity Radio, the voice of Husker Nation. Insight, opinion, expertise with the biggest and best names talking Nebraska across the state. Join the show on Twitter at Hale Varsity and at Schmitz underscore radio. Call in at 402-466-ESPN or 1-800-825-5865. Here's Chris Schmitz. Thanks for hanging out. We're at the State Tournament Central, a.k.a. Longwell's Roadshow Wednesday on Hale Varsity Radio. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal. Three quarters are in the books and uh, some wood chopping time for the unbeaten and top seed Milford Eagles here down to Concordia, Omaha, 42 to 27. I look around and I see uh, all great parts of the state of Nebraska. There's some North Platte representation. We've got Beatrice over there. We've got uh, Pierce behind me. Auburn and Pierce fans drinking beer together. And uh, I think I saw a priest in here too. That must be for me. Uh, So we will uh, hear and spend some time with Coach Tom Osborne next segment as uh, he was down receiving the uh, career achievement plaque uh, from some of his players today down in the uh, the hay market so our our thoughts in our q a with coach osborne coming up here in about uh, 15 minutes we welcome in hall of fame coach uh, with lincoln southeast and tremendous assistant at nebraska during the knee era we say hi to, to jeff smith you hear coach smith do his color work uh during our state basketball coverage on espn and kfor coach how's your wednesday treating you thanks for the time Pretty good, Chris. I got a uh, seven-year-old grandson in town on spring break, and I was a Jedi Knight about 15 minutes ago, so we're having fun. So, okay, did you make him put on the the old blaster helmet where there's no vision, or were you a little bit more forgiving? A little little more forgiving. We we, we weren't striking each other too hard, but it was a good time. (laughs) He's going to wind up and get your Achilles, you know? (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, he'll hurt me pretty soon. That's pretty good. Well, we'll get into some state tournament uh, talk here in a bit, but Husker basketball gets rolling tonight. Coach, how important is a, is a win 
tonight for Nebraska versus a, a, a just play well. They played better. They played a lot better with Coach Hoiberg and his kids. But um, they're still obviously a, a long ways off. And uh, the woulda, coulda part says, yes, 5-5 five and five in their last 10. The reality is they had a two-game losing, a winning streak followed by a two-game losing streak. And as you kind of ballpark this, what's your take on, on where things are at right now? Uh, this could be the final uh, final ball game for uh, for Fred and company this season. Yeah, I think. I mean, I think I feel like things are trending up. Um, their last few performances, when they move the ball um, and they and they share the ball with each other and they play the kind of defense they're capable of playing, um, we're seeing some trends that that hopefully can carry over. I think this one's pretty important because I think you've got to uh, build. Um, and continue to build, and I think winning a tournament game is part of that building process. Jeff Smith is with us on Hale Varsity Radio. We're here at Longwell's Tournament Central uh, Boys State going on here. Fourth quarter action, Milford, Concordia going on. You know, you're right with the trend and that arrow pointing upward, and uh, this will continue to build. What do you like about not only the personnel, but just what, from what you've seen of this Nebraska basketball program, they've had about everything and the kitchen sink thrown at them this year. Yeah, I, I like their resiliency. I like Doc. I think Doc's done a fantastic job with their defense. Their, their field goal percentage, three-point defense, has been great. It's, it's like 31%. Um, he's, he's done what he's had to do as far as jumping into some zones. That matchup has been pretty good. I like I like what Doc's done. I think Doc's been really good at focusing on one thing as an assistant coach and enjoying that and using all of his experience to help Nebraska win games with the defense. I really I do like the offense. I, I think uh, if they can just get a few more shooters in, um, a lot of a lot of the shots they take are really good shots when they're moving the ball. So I like the offense. But I don't like the rebounding deficits. I don't like the turnovers, which, you know, some, some are head scratchers. And I, I really don't like the free throw percentage. I think a college team has to be in at least in the 70s. Um, but as they get some shooters in here, if they can keep the core together, which in these days is a big question, if they can keep this core together and add Bryce McGowan's and, and the Tamananga kid, if he can really shoot it, I, I think we got a chance. Tell me why, from a coach's perspective, free throws are where they're at. Tell me why turnovers and, and, and not just deflected pass turnovers, but just mindless, oh, whoops, that's the wrong color, jersey-type turnovers. How and why do those happen at this level? Yeah, I, first of all, free throws. I, I don't think free throws are, are practiced quite as much. Um, I just don't think that uh, kids are taking the time to really get that routine down. And when I was with Coach Nee, we actually brought in a free throw specialist. He was a guy from, I think he was from Ohio or something that Danny knew. He, he gave us a notebook on free throw shooting. He had us shooting eyes closed free throws. He had us shooting free throws from the side of the basket on the baseline, everything 15 feet. He had, he had a drill, what I used in high school some, where you hit the front of the rim on purpose, you hit the back of the rim on purpose and then you swish it. He had all kinds of free throw games that we played, free throw golf, everything. We spent a lot of time on it, and I think to be a good free throw shooter, shooter you do, but I don't think it takes talent. Um, so I think, you know, free throw shooting there is pretty good. And I can't, what was the second part of your question, Chris? The turnovers. I mean, just, just oh. the awful, <laughs> careless, throwaway pick sixes, as Fred calls them. How can that happen yeah. at this level? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I, I know it's driving Coach Hoiberg crazy. I think some of it is playing on two feet a little bit more. I know he's mentioned three or four times in the interview that he just can't get them to stop on two feet like they practice. There's not enough carry over there. I think that's some of it. And then I think some of it is, you know, playing together in the system for a while longer, knowing where people are going, knowing where they're going to be. Um, and then there's, you know, unfortunately, there's guys that, that don't have vision and there's guys that have great vision. And sometimes the guys that don't have vision have that tunnel vision and they see their guy, they see their guy, but they don't see the defensive, how they're playing. That maybe they're going to switch and jump the passing lane. Um, it, it's kind of strange on different individuals that way. 
Jeff Smith's with us, uh, longtime assistant at Nebraska, longtime uh, head coach, Hall of Fame coach at Lincoln Southeast with us, Hale Bar City Radio, talking some college basketball, some some big red basketball. Jeff, uh, let's go back to, to that uh, 91 Nebraska team with Farmer and company and, and, uh, and Bo, Reed, and uh, the special run you guys had in, in the Big 8 tournament, and then also fast-forwarding to, to Pike's crew that capped it off and, and won it because uh, this time of year, as we're into March, I know it brings back memories for you. Yeah, it does. Um, the 91 team was kind of the breakthrough team, obviously. I, I, we, we didn't really know how good we were. And, you know, that, that first game in the tournament was the one that kind of kick-started us. We gained quite a bit of confidence during the se- confidence during the season, of course, beating some teams that we hadn't really beaten for a while and maybe even swept them in the, in the series. Um, so the confidence build was huge, and then winning that, I, I think first, first round tournament games sometimes the hardest one to win, as we've seen in the NCAA tournament with Nebraska. Uh, but great memories with that team. That team had depth, uh, depth and talent, um, even more than we even realized at the time. And then the Piakowski crew was, was just confidence. I think Bruce Chubbick, Eric Piakowski, and those guys, um, Eric Strickland, those guys had so much confidence that, they, that we were going to continue that kind of play, that kind of tradition, that we won games because we walked in and thought we were going to win and, <laughs> and refused to lose some. So those were, those were great memories, and I just, I just I can't wait till we get back to some of that uh, confidence and some of that dominance that we actually showed some. That's what Fred kind of alluded to in his in his final Zoom. This was Monday. I mean, he's talking in certainty, Coach, that it's going to happen where, hey, when we get to this point in the near future, Nebraska is going to be playing to bump their seed like we did in Iowa State. Nebraska is going to be playing knowing we're in. I mean, he has so much conviction in his voice with it. And, and I know it's just a couple of wins in the Big Ten. I know it's another 7 and, and 18 or 7 and 19 season. But when I hear Fred tell me what's screwed up and when I hear Fred tell me this is where I think it, it's getting better and then it happens, y- you believe him. But when you hear his tone about what the future, look like, future looks like, what's your reaction to it? I'm with him, I, but like I said, I'm worried about you – know, when we got Tony Farmer as a transfer, back then, Keith Moody, you didn't have to worry about those guys transferring again. That was not a thing. Gotcha. Now you have to worry about guys taking off after – I mean, is Delano Banton going to stay around? You know, is, are all those guys going to stick? Is Lat Mayen going to stay around? I hope and pray they are because I think it's a tough build in the Big Ten – if you don't have guys stay together for two or three years with the level of talent you need. But I think offensively they can if they just add a little shooting. There's no doubt defensively they can with Doc's mind. Um, I'm, I'm optimistic, even though you hate the record. You're not, it's not fun to watch them lose that much. But I'm, I'm still pretty optimistic about Fred Hoiberg and crew. Jeff Smith's with us on Hale Varsity Radio. We're here at Longwell's and uh, Tournament Central. Coach, uh, let's switch gears to some high school ball. And uh, what have your, your impressions been uh, so far through this uh, first part of Class A? We know Millard North's there. We know Easton Pius got eliminated, but great efforts. You have uh, Bell West still there, and, of course, Prep and, and, and Millard West. You and I will have both semis tomorrow, uh, Friday night. But uh, has the, the tournament lived up to, to your hope and, and your hype so far? Yeah, so far it has. I mean, it's gone to it's gone to chalk except for the Millard West win over Pius. And I, I think that uh, everybody's anticipating Bell West and Millard North, and I think they're even kind of anticipating that. Um, did you did you you have me there? Let me get. Yeah, my, I, I, I got I'm you. Not sure. I got you. Sorry about that. You got no, me. You're fine. Okay. Yep. But I think everybody's anticipating you know Bell West Millard North again, which would be great to see. I hope those schools, you know, you know, you, that first rounders are kind of tough, and like Miller North playing Miller South was kind of a tough matchup for them. If if they're looking ahead, uh, I think Prep could. Prep has played every all these teams really close 
they could have something to say about it. But uh, in my eyes, we're going to go back to watching Chucky Hepburn and guys like that in the finals, and, and I'm excited about that. Coach, it, it's been a few years since we've seen a, a Lincoln school in the final. Last time that uh, a Lincoln school won the state championship was Lincoln High back in, I think, 03. Um, what do you make of that now that both Lincoln schools have been knocked out of the, the Class A uh, state tournament? Is Omaha basketball just that much further ahead of, of Lincoln basketball at this time? I think with I think with OSA, um, they got a little jump on Lincoln as far as, as uh, club teams at the lower levels. Um, I think Lincoln's caught up with some of that now. It might take a few years to show. My other philosophy on that is Omaha's kind of gone to the superpowers. They they a lot of the same kids, a lot of the better kids go to the same schools. Obviously, prep can recruit a little bit. Um, Bell West has that tradition that a lot of kids want to go there and play because they've won some recent state tournaments and Doug Woodard's such a good coach. They know they're going to be central with, with Barons who, who probably should have got in this year. Um, you know, the Miller North are going to be good for a while. It's kind of a, it kind of develops into some superpowers that are really hard for Lincoln schools to be. I mean, imagine if, um, A.J. Hogan goes and plays with Donovan Williams last year, and Carter Glenn goes over and plays there. That's kind of kind of what's happening in Omaha some, that those kids, if they're good players, they want to go play with the other good players and kind of develop dominant teams, and that's kind of what's happening. And that's not really happening here. The kids kind of go where they're supposed to go, not a lot of transferring. I think that has a little to do with it as well. But Omaha's seeing a good run on talent right now, too. you got four Division One players at Millard North. you got – you know, two or three um, at Bell West. And it's so it, they have a good run of, of high level talent, a little more D1 talent than Lincoln has right now as well. How are your, your coaching brethren in Omaha feeling, Coach Smith, about the agglomeration talent? Great if it's in your backyard, but if it's leaving your yard, it's got to be pretty frustrating. <laughs> I tell you, there's a lot more grumbling amongst between the coaches or, you know, talk between the coaches than there is with the NSAA or anything like that. It's just, it's, I, I know they're frustrated, but it's not, it's not where they're trying to go get evidence of people recruiting and go and turn each other in. And it's just, I don't know. They're just too classy of people. Coaches are, I think. And, you know, I always felt like I want to take kids that want to come to my school and coach those kids and if they don't want to be here, then how am I going to how am I going to really coach them anyway? And I think that's what a lot of the coaches feel. They they don't like it when kids go out of their district. But right now, there's not a lot of rules stopping them, um, and they're just they're just doing the best they can. We hear about it, but but really outside of that, there's not much there's not much banter. Jeff Smith with us, uh, longtime coach at Nebraska and head coach and Hall of Famer at Lincoln Southeast. State tournament thoughts and some Husker hoops. Coach, have a good uh, rest of your Wednesday with your grandson. We'll get caught up Friday for state tournament ball. Thanks for your time. Yeah, see you for those. Hey, it was great having students in the fans in the stands yesterday, wasn't it? Oh, it was so much energy. Yeah. So much energy, and, and that energy is down here in uh, in the rail yard, my friend. And feels normal again, Coach. Thanks again. Yep, thanks. We'll see you Friday. All right, there he is. He's awesome. The head coach, former uh, head coach at Lincoln Southeast and uh, Hall of Famer and uh, longtime assistant with Danny Knee. That is Jeff Smith. We'll talk to another Hall of Famer uh, conversation from earlier with uh, Coach Tom Osborne as uh, he was able to get his uh, career achievement plaque. Uh, That was an award earlier today. Some comments on college football, spring football. That's next. Dale Varsity on the road. Longwells were presented by the Nebraska Lottery. And we're back. Fellas, you think we could listen to the radio? On Hale Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Yes! That's awesome! Back here down at Longwells Tournament Central. It's a Wednesday road show, Longwells, and it is absolutely jammed. And right now, Milford, uh, the top seed in trouble, down 12. We've got our friends from uh, Auburn, Nebraska, to our left. Our friends from Pierce, Nebraska, to our right. Uh, A lot of Carney folks, and we love our friends in Carney, 1460, 1550. 
Uh, Carney Hastings Grand Island. There's a Doug Duda siding as he is getting ready to do Carney Catholic basketball tonight. Dude, dude is the mayor is what it comes down to. And uh, we are uh, inviting you down uh, if you get a shot to the uh, rail yard in Longwells, not only tonight for Nebraska, Penn State, but also throughout this glorious weekend of high school tournament action and ESPN Lincoln and KFOR Lincoln will have your state tournament coverage with Norris and uh, with Waverly and of course the Class A semis and championships so uh, let's uh, get into it it was exciting to see and spend some time with Coach Osborne earlier today so the, the setup is this uh, Mike Osborne uh, said, hey, Dad, we need you to come down to the store, Best of Big Red, and uh, we need you to sign some children's books. And, and T.O.'s got a, got a children's book out there, and T.O.'s kind of like, sure, sure, why not? Well, uh, the, uh, the setup was there, and it was kind of a surprise deal where <laughs> Coach Osborne was, was honored by a high number of, of former players where there was a special award presented by the alumni cap folks and that's uh josh davis tony davis and, and amon green are in charge of that but coach osborne got to sit down and heard at media did a, a phenomenal job of setting up and showing the video uh of the players there uh, you know i love yous and thanks coach uh, Grant Wistrom, Neil Smith, Trev Alberts was was he made the trip down to, to be with Coach uh, Kenny Wilhide, obviously Kenny's phenomenal, and then Steve Glenn, and uh, Steve Glenn was a captain and a standout offensive lineman late seventies, and I go back a ways with uh, with Paul, uh, Steve's son, and it was just really cool. And what what these career achievement plaques do is, um, you know, they they honor every letter winner, both men and women. And it's a, a living memorial and, and standard of commitment to coaches and teammates. And T.O. Was, was honored. So as, as you guess, T.O. is still quick with his wit and, and still has that awesome dry sense of humor with, uh, with, well, hey, I've got a lot of football awards, but this is probably the biggest. And this plaque is, is monstrous. It's really cool. So uh, Coach Osborne spent some time uh, – talking uh, about a lot of different things got out seven or eight minutes with him and we kind of chopped it up a little bit so we can hear uh hear it isolated a little bit and big thanks to elijah herbal for doing this and let's uh let's begin here with some of coach osborne's comments first and foremost uh his reaction to this award and think about this i mean osborne's gotten coaches of the year awards big eight coach of the year mentor of the year Right. I mean, there's not a, 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 a wall that's, that's barren in the guy's house when it comes to his trophy room. But this uh, career achievement plaque meant so much to him because not only who reached out to him, but the fact that, that there was so much love uh, by his kids. And here's Coach Osborne on his, his surprise with this award. That was very nice. Yeah, it looks, looks good. And... Uh... I'll find a place to to put it, and uh, it was really nice to hear from so many players that that was uh, that was fun. I know uh, some some of these guys drove away so, to come down. And, uh, Trev, you know, obviously he was busy, and so it's kind of them to do it. And uh, I think the the good thing about coaching for me is is not the wins, the losses, the trophies. It's more the relationships and. Uh, you know, those tend, tend to go on. So it's hardly any week that goes by where I don't hear from two or three or four players. And um, and so, uh, and, and I think those relationships for the most part have been really solid. And, and so that's been really enjoyable. And there aren't, aren't very many professions where you're able to maintain those kinds of relationships over a long period of time. And, uh, and I guess uh, it's something, something like the military when you, when you go through some difficult times and some challenging situations together, it does build a bond. It's a little bit hard to replicate any place else other than maybe the military. And uh, so it was uh, gratifying to hear from all these guys. 
So Coach Osborne spent some time on on what he's been doing. He's obviously at, at practice, and he's still keeping an eye on Nebraska football. But he's uh, really dialing up teammates, and it's been a it's been a crazy year for all of us, right? But think about mentoring and distance learning, and his work with kids uh, still super important. More from Coach Osborne here when it comes to teammates and what they've done uh, during COVID and what they want to do here once we get out of COVID. Well, I spend most of my spare time working with teammates, mentoring, and this last year we mentored about 11,000 kids. And uh, of course, it's been interrupted some with all the school closures, And uh, but we've now built some virtual mentoring platforms where if uh, some mentors uh, reluctant to go into the schools or the school is closed, we can still do some mentoring. And, and so uh, that's been a good thing because uh, now we'll be able to do a better job over the summer, vacation periods, and somebody's sick. And uh, so I think that's that's been good. And uh, But I also would say that kids are probably under more stress this last year. It's been harder on them because the familiar routine, routines and the, the normal support systems just haven't been there. And, uh, and so mental health, health issues, and all kinds of of uh, trauma have, have been more prevalent this last year and so uh, we're always looking for more mentors and hope we can cr- uh, recruit a few here in the next few months so let's get into some football talk with coach osborne a chance to spend time with him earlier today as uh, it was the career achievement plaque ceremony where coach was coach was presented with his career achievement plaque uh by uh by Josh Davis. This uh, was Coach Osborne, his comment, his uh, excitement as, as spring football's around the corner and really uh, kind of cut down to what what hurt a lot of programs, including Nebraska last year with the pandemic, and that is, you know, the development time or lack thereof. Here's Coach Osborne on looking ahead to spring football. Last year, we went without a spring ball, and and I think that really handicapped uh, a lot of teams, and particularly the young players. You know, a lot of these kids are coming in now and at the uh, semester, they're coming in in January, and they would normally be in high school. So they're only 17 years of age, and then uh, not miss, missing spring ball was really a handicap for those guys. And uh, so I think that'll help. And we probably have 10 or 12 guys on campus right now that are here for the first time this semester. and. Uh, so it'll certainly help them, give them a, a lot better chance to to be productive this next fall if they can go through spring football. That's so big for Frost and Nebraska to get those practices, get those reps. Coach Osborne touched on Oklahoma, the phone call from Joe Castiglione, and setting up this uh, reunion here down in Norman, the 50th anniversary of the game of the century. But uh, his take on Nebraska, Oklahoma, as that looms here in September. When I was athletic director, Joe Castiglione called me from Oklahoma and said, we've got to to get together again. So we scheduled that about, I don't know, it's been eight or nine years since it was scheduled. And uh, and I've thought a little bit about whether that was wise or not. (laughs) But, uh, you know, circumstances change, and Scott's had to do a lot of rebuilding, and so we'll we'll see how it plays out. But anyway, um, we'll see how it goes. But... Uh, I think I think we'll have a better team. This is me uh, speaking from the 50th row. You know, I, I don't I don't have a lot of inside knowledge, but I I think there's going to be a lot of things that are going to be improved, and so I'm looking forward to the season. So, coach always laid out there. Look, this is me as a as a fan. 50th row. Uh, I, I'd like his fans' eyes, right? <laughs> how's the How's the right guard doing on the reach block? More from Coach Osborne as we stayed on the Oklahoma topic and uh, the, the Nebraska-Oklahoma rivalry and, and just what that meant. It was a absolute double-edged sword here during his career. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, that became the measuring stick. And, uh, you know, you could win 10 games, and if you lost to Oklahoma, it was a bad year. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that was a little uncomfortable because we did, we did lose some early particularly. And... Uh, but then we kind of even the score a little bit more later on in the 80s and the 90s. But uh, it was the thing about it was initially it was always played on Friday, and for a great many people that was the only game that was available on that Friday. 
right after Thanksgiving, so a lot of people weren't working. And uh, so it drew a, a fairly large television audience. And as a result, uh, I think nationally it was beneficial probably to both programs because of the exposure. And, uh, and usually those were fairly close games and hard-fought games and well-played games. And uh, so, so uh, I have some fond memories and I have some pretty bad memories <laughs> from those Fridays. Coach just nailed it. I mean, you talk about exposure. You're talking about the only show in town or the only game on that Friday. The magnitude, by the way, you're both in the top five. It felt like every year you were playing or somebody was in the top five. And uh, it had uh, mass appeal. West Coast, East Coast, center. And um, it, it was it was big time. Last thought here from Coach Osborne as we caught up with him earlier today, Hale Varsity Radio. Uh, I think Oklahoma, I think of quarterbacks at Nebraska, those guys were the difference makers. How do you deal with the portal and the quarterback situation specifically in college football? Here's the coach. Yeah, I think uh, coaching is certainly more complicated today. Uh, the transfer portal, the, uh, the, grand, the graduation thing where if you graduate, you can transfer with impunity and uh, all the coming and going and, and of course I think a lot of our fans are not used to that so they every time somebody transfers they uh, they are very concerned and, and think they were falling apart but every other school is going through the same thing and uh, so I think that uh, having a, a team that you can count on that you know for sure those guys are going to come back as juniors and seniors uh, has become more and more, more and more complex and Coach Osborne, good to hear from him. Good to spend time with him. Hale Varsity, live here at Longwells. As uh, we'll continue on, we're presented by the Nebraska Lottery. He's in his 30s, but sounds like he was born with a stogie in one hand and a brew in the other. Now, say my name. It's Schmitty on Hale Varsity Radio. I got the body of a caught preteen Swedish boy. Back with you, Tail Bar City Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery State Tournament Central. We're down here at Longwells, and so many different folks ran into folks from Auburn, ran into folks from, uh, you know, uh, the uh, the Milford region, and uh, a lot of red over here. Crete camped out by the bar. We welcome in uh, Dr. Ben Woodhead with Lincoln Orthopedic Center at Jock Doc Wednesday. Dr. Ben, it's uh, it's a great time of year, man. State tournament time. How are you? I'm doing good. It is. It brings back lots of memories. Well, uh, spring baseball around uh, the quarter. Of course, colleges are underway. Uh, my little guy, Junior, is actually in Tampa for the Yankees spring training, and we're going to focus on lefty Zach Britton, uh, one of the, the Yanks uh, relievers, and he underwent an MRI that showed a, a bone chip in his left elbow and that's going to be needed to be removed and the club announced that uh, later y yesterday and kind of give me uh, your synopsis here of you know big picture issues with bone chips and pitchers and the remedy here when it comes to medical procedure uh, recovery and uh, discomfort all of that uh, when it comes to a guy who's got a really good arm but man this is an ailment that, that's not good for him yeah, absolutely. So a bone spur, a bone chip in the elbow is a little bit different than probably the bone spurs you you'd classically kind of hear about with arthritis in the knee or, you know, in the shoulder. So in an athletic type of individual, he likely sheared off some bone from whether it was an injury or whether he was pitching. Uh, but the problem with the elbow, it's such a tiny little joint. Uh, likely what he has, he probably has a little piece of bone that's moving around. And so always puts him out of propensity for maybe the elbow locking up or if it moves from little place to place in the elbow, you know, it certainly can cause a tremendous amount of pain. It's almost kind of the same same analogy as having like a rock in the gearbox. And so uh, it's a problem that really won't go away unless you arthroscopically, which is going in with a scope, um, looking at it with a tiny little camera and taking it away. Uh, now, it sounds easy enough, but elbow scopes are not as commonly performed as, you know, the common knee scope or the common shoulder scope. In fact, most people don't routinely do these. These are, these are types of procedures that uh, only a select few of surgeons do just because the complex 
um, anatomy surrounding the area. So uh, he should have a good prognosis as long as they're able to get the, the bone out and there's no complications from the procedure. You know, he should be able to be back in, in a few months gradually getting back to activities. Dr. Ben Woodhead's with us at Jock Doc Wednesday, Lincoln Orthopedic Center. We're talking Zach Britton, relief pitcher for the Yankees, as uh, New York uh, is again dealing with uh, an elbow ailment, elbow surgery after an MRI showed a bone chip. So when we talk about Britton, and you kind of laid out just the difficulty of, of that procedure, uh, it sounds pretty complex, and, and from a technological standpoint, there's all sorts of new toys uh, that, that the doctors and the medical community have and use. But uh, when it comes to, to just the catching all of those bone fragments, the, the chips, you know how minuscule they are. Um, th- that's kind of always a concern, isn't it? Making sure you got it all cleaned up. Yeah, it absolutely is. And the elbow is a unique joint because... Um, you know, when you go into the knee or the shoulder, you're kind of in one kind of compartment for the most part. The elbow kind of has all these little nooks and crannies that you have to make sure you look in every corner to make sure that you're getting everything. And so the last thing you want to do is go into this big operation, go in there with a scope and actually miss something or leave, leave a bone chip in there. So you have to do, do your due diligence, take a lot of time, um, look around and make sure that you get absolutely every little bony piece or cartilage piece in the elbow joint and remove it for the best possible outcome. Dr. Ben Woodhead's with us, Lincoln Orthopedic Center at Jock Doc Wednesday. And uh, we're talking Zach Britton and MRI showed bone chips. A procedure done uh, microscopically for the Yankee reliever. Interested uh, in your take here from just the recovery side. All right, the scope is done. The chips are removed. And what's the process look like for Britain to get back? And then what are some potential hang-ups in your estimation here from returning to, to full form here on the hill for him? Yeah, well, as a surgeon, you know, your always hang-up is, you know, just safely being able to do the operation without having any complications and making sure safely you get into the elbow joint, make sure that you um, don't get involved with any nerves. That's kind of the utmost important when you're doing a procedure like this. So after that, though, um, the nice thing from just doing a bone chip removal or going in there and removing anything in there is that you're not actually doing any repairs. You know, you hear about the the classic Tommy John surgery that pitchers have where you're repairing ligaments or rotator cuff surgeries. Um, You're not really relying on any tissue to heal into the bone or um, anything from that matter. So from that standpoint, he's got a lot going for him in the sense you go in there, you take the bone chip out, um, you wait till all the swelling goes down from his elbow, um, and you really are just hopeful that he will be able to rehab and get back to throwing. And so, you know, likely after the first six weeks, Dr. Chris Ahmad, I think, is doing the surgery. He'll probably have him transition to some slow throwing once he gets his full, uh, full motion back, and then they'll gradually progress him from that standpoint. That would be my, that would be my thoughts on what they'll be. The, uh, the, the region feel like for Britain as he comes back. In comparison to some, some, some other arm ailments, is it a situation where he's tender or he feels fine, but there's still a little hitch in his giddy-up when it comes to throwing uh, all the different pitches and changing the speeds there? What's 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 the, uh, the aftermath feel like for an athlete after one of these procedures? Hopefully, you know, hopefully it is really truly just a bone spur and he doesn't, or a bone chip in there and he doesn't have much arthritis. And so, you know, the goal would be that he's have a, he'd have a full recovery and hopefully get back to the velocity that he's pitching at. You know, usually when people have these types of injuries, the reason they're having pain is because that, as that piece of bone is moving around, it really just causes, causes pain as they get in terminal ranges of motion. And so um, really with not having to rely on anything necessarily healing and being repaired, his prognosis should be fairly good, um, depending that it's a mild kind of condition. Dr. Ben, real quick, about a minute here. Uh, when it comes to velocity, when it comes to, to the ability to, to snap that curveball or, or fire the slider, uh, the region that this procedure's done on, could that cause issues with his stuff? Yeah, it certainly could. Um, you know, he will likely have some swelling on and off for, 
you know, months after this. And so it's going to be important that he gets in the training room, that he works with therapy, that he ices appropriately. Um, Because as he comes back to throwing, uh, he won't have thrown for a certain amount of time. And so as he starts using those muscles again, he's going to be more sore. He's not going to be used to throwing at that type of velocity. So it's going to be imperative uh, that he rehabs like he should. You know, they have the best trainers and they're up to date on all the latest advancements from a treatment standpoint from that point. And so uh, you know that they'll be, be having him worked on appropriately. Dr. Ben Woodhead, Lincoln Orthopedic Center with Jock Doc Wednesday. Dr. Ben, take care. Thanks for the time today. Thanks a lot, Chris. Enjoy yourself. Good stuff. We're uh, down here at Longwell's Tournament Central. Uh, appreciate uh, Dr. Ben Woodhead with us. We'll wind down a Wednesday. Nebraska Penn State State Tournament action continues forward to Tail Varsity presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Miss us? Come here, brother. Give me a hug. Bring it in for the real thing. We're on call for you. Catch the podcast at HailVarsity.com, the ESPN Lincoln app, or download them on iTunes. Saddle up, partner. Back to Hail Varsity Radio. One final time down here at Longwell's Tournament Central Boys State 2021, Nebraska Penn State coming up as well. Uh, Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal, good stuff uh, with Coach Osborne as he joined us uh, a little bit earlier in the hour from earlier in the day. And uh, we're going to do a steak and a beer bet in uh, just a moment. But uh, I want to remind you about uh, buckling up and the best defense uh, when it comes to saving lives and, and fatalities is using your safety belt uh, when it comes to uh, 70% of wrecks. uh, Using that safety belt can help uh, keep your life, save your life. This message from the Nebraska Department of Highway Safety Office. So, Elijah, the line is six and a half. Penn State is favored, my friend. Uh, What's what's your gut say right now? Uh, Steak and a beer bed I had. Two, I got home later last night, but I grilled anyway. And I did uh, two, uh, two like little six ounce fillets, you know, from like the Dill Goulds thing. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's what I got for Christmas was a box of meat. Sweet. It's the best um, Christmas present, honestly. It, it is. Uh, so the, the best part of it was is medium rare, perfect, you know, tenderloin slash fillet. And the wife is like, well, I just went a little bit. So uh, I ate like half of hers, which was incredible. Well, 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 with this weather we're having, it it might be just about time for me to pay up on my stake in a beer bet from from football season. (laughs) Yeah. And just let me grill it. (laughs) I'll I'll let you grill it. I'll I'll bring the meat. It's on. You're the grill master here. Yeah. No, what what we'll do is we got to like, because it's it's all you and Damon Barr and Willie J next week after Wednesday. You know, that Wednesday. Thursday, Friday, Monday, Tuesday. I'm losing golf balls again down in Arizona at Joe Mama's. Excited about that. But, no, we'll, we'll fire up the grill for sure. And, uh, yeah, we'll just throw a little party in the backyard. Somebody can trank Gertie. Someone can hog tie Roz. And it'll be, it'll be pleasant. Who are you going with? You going with Penn State tonight? Or are you going with uh, Nebraska? Well, you asked about my gut. And my, my gut tells me that Fred Hoiberg is not going to be 0-2 in Big Ten tournament games after two seasons. He's too good of a head coach for that. Uh, I think somehow, some way, the Husker basketball team gets it done tonight and gets a win. So I'm going to take the Huskers to, to cover that 6.5 and, and actually win outright. Uh, that, that's, uh, that's where I'm going with this. See, I think you're not wrong with Fred being too good a coach. And, and I love Fred's optimism. I like Fred's athleticism with this team. Fred has guys that that are idiots at, at times. Nobody's perfect. We're all idiots. That said, Nebraska plays like they're disengaged or, or not locked in too often, right? And I, I don't like the run Banton's been on. Uh, I think McGowan's is, is not playing where he was back during their winning streak. I mean, you look at Lat kind of passing on that shot the other night against Northwestern. Now, Webster's been phenomenal. Uh, I like that. Uh, give me Penn State to win 
and I don't think I think Nebraska covers, but I guess I'm going to go Penn State the win outright, 74-70. Is that all right? Yeah, it works for me. All right, we will uh, check in tomorrow. Hail Varsity at four. We're presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Get on down to Longwells. Thanks.